So now that we have looked at the different kinds of messages which the browser sends to the server and the server sends to the browser, let's actually try and uh, test these messages. We'll try to issue these messages on our own and see what happens. So in order to do our testing, so what I'm going to do is uh, I am going back to tools and I'm going to launch something called as a WebSocket client. So this would let us make a WebSocket connection to the server and issue our own WebSocket messages. So uh, for the WebSocket URL, so in order to find out the URL uh, that we have to enter here, what I'll do is I'll go to the uh, WebSocket logs, I'll go to the headers and uh, I'll take the host name, I'll put that here, I'll take the URL, I'll put that here, and then uh, let's find out if it's over SSL. So this particular WebSocket session is not using SSL. So it would be WS colon slash slash. If it was using SSL, then it would be WSS. So since it's not using SSL, I'll say WSS uh, colon slash slash. Now I have to enter the origin headers value. So I'll go here, I'll copy this, which is the value of the origin header. I'll put that here. And then the value of the cookie header. So this specific uh, request uh, does not have a cookie header. Let's confirm that. No, there, there are no cookie headers. If there was a cookie header, then the value of the cookie header would be, I would have to be placed here. So then I'll say connect. It says connecting, socket opened. So now this basically means that we have created a WebSocket connection to the server and we should be able to send messages from here. So uh, so I'll go here, I'll, I'll copy the WebSocket message which uh, we found in the logs. So I'll put that here, I'll say send message. And we can see the response that came back from the server. And uh, the response is uh, code session started and then a session ID value. Okay. Now let's issue the second uh, WebSocket message, which is uh, okay. So we'll ignore the keep alive. Okay. The second message is get product. So let me copy that. Now I could uh, paste it here and then I send the message, but then rather than overwrite this box, let me create a new tab. I'll say the uh, get product message. So I've created a new tab, I'll put this message here and I'll have to update the session ID. So I'll copy this session ID value and put it here. Okay, there we go. Send message. Okay, so now you can see that uh, once I clicked on send message, we can see the list of all products from the server. Okay, so now let me issue the third message, which is get product. All right, so I'll go to add remove messages. I'll say get product message. I'll add a new tab. I'll put that there, and again, I'll have to update the session ID. Do that. Okay, send message. And then here we can see the information about the selected product. Now, if I change the product ID to 1002, then we can see that the product information that's returned is different than the one which was there, uh, you know, than the message returned earlier. Okay, so we are uh, using the WebSocket client. We are able to establish a WebSocket connection and then issue these commands. Now, uh, since we are able to replicate what the browser has done so far, let's try a little bit more. Let's actually try to play around uh, and see what happens. So I'll go to the get products message. And uh, so this command has been something which all the WebSocket messages from the browser contain. 
So there is a command called start session or get product or get product. Now let me actually go and uh, type XYZ here and let's see what happens. So we are sending a request with the, with the, with the command get product XYZ. Okay, so what it says is the message that we get is invalid command. The specified command is not recognized. So let me try something else. I'll say get products one, two, three. Again, it says the same thing. It says invalid command. Now, when we issue a valid command, uh, then we get you know some kind of uh, a normal response from or a normal message from the server, which contains the results of our command execution. But when we issue a command, uh, you know, with with some junk command value, then, uh, you know, we get a message which says invalid command. So, I think this behavior could actually be used to guess what commands are recognized by the server. Uh, so, so far, looking at the logs, we've only been identified three, we, we've only been able to identify three commands. Now, by no means, you know, uh, the, these are the only three commands which this implementation, uh, you know, uh, supports. It could be, uh, it, it could, it could be entirely possible that there are ten or fifteen different commands which the implementation supports, but only three of these commands have been found in the logs. So what we could actually do is we could try and guess the different command names. So I could try something like, uh, for example, get users. Says incomplete message. Okay. So it did not say invalid command, but rather it said incomplete message. Some of the required fields are missing in the command. Now this basically means that get users is a valid command. It's it's only that I have I'm missing some field in the, in the in in the message that I'm sending. So if I add that extra field, then you know I should be able to see the list of all users. So. Uh, you know, it's possible to enumerate the different commands available on the server. Now, uh, in a different video, I'll actually show you how you could automatically guess this using a script. But for now, I think uh, by manually trying out different combinations, uh, you, you can find out if a particular command exists on the server or not. So let's try get... Uh, okay get error. Now when I say get error, it says code is take error and then it gives me an info, right? Now it did not say invalid command, it did not say incomplete message, but instead it says take error. So this basically means that get error is a valid command and the response I'm getting is the valid message uh, or the valid reaction to the get error uh, uh, message. But uh, we don't see any error information, probably because no error was, uh, th th there was no exception on the server. So, you know, there are no errors to display. Okay, so, you know, uh, so at this point we have uh, done something interesting. We have identified that there is a command called get error on this, which is supported by the server. Now let's go to the other uh, message, which is get product message. Now this message has uh, it not just has the command, but it ha also has the product ID. Now, depending on what the product ID is, uh, probably the server does a database query and then it returns the data information of that particular uh, uh, product. So what we'll actually do is we'll try to see if we can enter some invalid message here and, and see what kind of an error happens. So I'll put it into double quotes and I'll type xxx. So the code is take product and then the product information is blank. So, uh, you know, th this particular part is empty. Now I'll go here, I'll let me say get error. Let's see if this has actually caused an error to happen on the server. Okay, the error is empty. I'll go to get product message again. Now, this time, now since uh, this looks like a candidate where, you know, uh, this data could be uh, used in a SQL query to get, to find out the uh, product message information. Let's try 
entering a single code, which is very normal uh, when you look testing for SQL injection. So I've just entered a single code. I'll say send message. And uh, it says, uh, okay, so this time it did not actually give any response. Now let me remove the single code. It gives the product information. And if I put a single code, then we do not get any message. So this is an interesting behavior. Adding single code seems to, uh, you know, have some kind of an effect on the server because if instead of single code, if I just put an hyphen, then it says take product and the product is empty. But if I put a single code, then uh, there is no response or there is no message from the server. Now let's go back and see if there's any error on the server. So I'll go to get error and I'll say send message. And you can actually see that now the take error message contains uh, detailed error information. So this looks like an exception which happened on the server. And it's an exception in the uh, XPath uh, parser. So this probably means that the server was uh, storing all the product information in an XML file and it was using an XPath query and this XPath query is vulnerable to XPath injection. So uh, entering a single code basically uh, you know, throws the XPath, uh, ex you know, XPath exception. So, so far using the WebSocket client, we have been able to uh, reissue the messages which the browser had issued. We were able to discover uh, a couple of new uh, commands. So one was get users, the other is get error. And uh, we were also able to find out that the ID field is vulnerable to wake path injection. So, so this is what we've done using the WebSocket client. Now, uh, so whatever we did here manually could actually be automated uh, or it could be scripted using uh, 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 an API which is exposed by the same WebSocket client binary. Now I'll try to explain how this happens uh, from the scripting shell of Vinewasp. 